Hi, everyone, and welcome to tonight's session. Uh, we are here with Scott Kesnick. We're so happy to have him join us today. He is our in-house sort of resident health care attorney, and he's going to talk with us about contract negotiations and employment agreements. Um, so we have a lot to cover tonight, and I'm just going to go ahead and uh, hand it over to Scott. All right. Thanks, Pam. And thanks, everyone, for joining this webinar. Um, I'm going to give you just sort of a brief introduction to me. Um, I'm, um, my name is Scott Kesnick. Um, I'm a healthcare attorney. Uh, that means that I practice in an industry, I practice in the healthcare industry, um, and about 90% of my work is in healthcare, and um, most of that work is actually working with physicians or physician-owned companies in business issues. Uh, so I don't do malpractice, I'll do kind of anything else. That involves uh, a lot of employment um, representation or advice, either on behalf of a physician um, or working with uh, an employer um, on issues that might involve a physician or um, staff or someone else. So we're going to talk today about um, employment contracts. Um, I know that a lot of people um, watching this video, I know you're all uh, members of CAFP and um, I know a lot of you are either medical students or residents. Um, and so we're going to talk today about how to approach uh, negotiating or at least even maybe just reading <laughs> the uh, often very long employment contract that you'll be presented from a prospective employer, most likely um, right before uh, you, you um, have committed to uh, joining the group. So I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen in a second. The first thing I would say before I do that, and I have to say this, is that I'm not your attorney. This isn't legal advice. Don't rely on this webinar to make decisions. This is informational and hopefully it'll be um, helpful uh, to you. Um, I'm gonna start sharing my screen now. I've got a PowerPoint. So um, that should be popping up. Uh, we're gonna do it from the beginning. All right, so these are sort of the, um, areas I'm going to cover. I don't really think it's worth going through each one right now. Um, the uh, one thing I wanted to note before I jump into the slide is that I offer a service. So while I'm not uh, your attorney right now in connection with the California Academy of Family Physicians, I offer a, a contract review service um, for a relatively reasonable fee. I will look at your employment contract and I will have a conversation with you about issues that I spot um, or uh, answer any questions that you have or concerns you have about that contract. Um, and this is something that I've been doing for about five years in connection with CAFP. Um, I think it's a cool service. Um, I'm biased, uh, but I think it, it, most people, I think, get a lot of value out of it and appreciate sort of having someone who's looked at a lot of these contracts look at theirs and see if there's anything crazy about it. Um, and sometimes there is, most of the time there's not. Um, but just so jumping into the slide, I think many of you, you know, before you went into med school, um, you worked, I'm sure. Um, and when you did that, you didn't get a long contract, probably. You probably got an email or an offer letter and it said how much you were gonna get paid um, and it um, you know, didn't say much else. And that is very, very common for most workers in California. California is what they call an at-will state. So the default rule, meaning if there's no contrary agreement, the rule is that you can quit uh, mostly at any time and the employer can fire you at any time and no reason has to be given. Okay, that's pretty normal. For physicians, it's not usually like that. You're usually gonna get um, a pretty long contract. This is for historical and regulatory reasons. They're getting longer. So I've been looking at these things for five years. You know, I can, they're increasing, the page numbers are increasing yearly. Um, so right now, you know, it's not unusual to see a 30 or 40 or even 50 page employment contract. 
Um, so they're kind of intimidating. Um, I just a real quick preface. I'm not going to talk about salary on this webinar. I'm not going to talk about bonus. By the time you get your prospective employment contract, um, these things have typically been worked out. So what, what are we talking about here? We're talking about you've identified your pr prospective employer, you've negotiated your salary, you've negotiated your bonus, and they're sending you a 40 page contract. And we're going to spend the rest of this webinar trying to figure out um, how to uh, approach that, potentially negotiate key provisions. I'm mostly going to focus on a few key provisions that I've seen over and over and over again that are sort of the ones that I think you should think about the most um, when you're looking at these contracts. Um, the one concept that I'm just going to introduce right now is like a concept that I don't know if it has a formal name. I sort of call it negotiation leverage. It's almost like negotiation goodwill. When you um, are negotiating a contract with a potential employer, you only have so much ability uh, to, to uh, change the terms. So the point being, you should focus um, on specific uh, terms that I think are the most important or that you think are the most important and ignore the stuff that maybe doesn't matter and not waste your negotiating leverage or goodwill on that stuff. So we're going to talk about sort of some of those terms and we're also going to talk about a few areas that I don't think you should worry too much about. Um, so we can sort of uh, jump right in. I would say probably like 70 or 80% of the time in my experience, a prospective employer will tell uh, 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 the physician employee that they're just getting, they're receiving a standard contract. I can assure you uh, there is no such thing as a standard contract. There are thousands of employers in California of physicians and um, they all pretty much have different contracts. They're similar, um, but they're different. The, a company, so if you're, if you're getting involved with a large, uh, for example, a large hospital system that's employing physicians, that company likely does have a standard contract, but I oftentimes understand that the implication of saying it's a standard contract is that this is the standard contract. There's nothing unusual in here. You should accept it. Take that with a grain of salt. The contracts vary tremendously. The other point I'd make just at the beginning here um, is that while it may be a standard contract for an organization, that does not mean it's necessarily in your favor. In fact, mostly what's happened is they hired a lawyer to make a contract very one-sided against you. So keep that in mind when you're reading the contract. Your advantage as an employee is that you've got the labor code of California protecting you in a lot of ways. A lot of these provisions are often just unenforceable. They'll say things, but you can't enforce them because they're unlawful under California law. So you have a lot of advantages as an employee and these contracts are often used to try to like make the uh, a level playing field from the perspective of the employer. That's just something to keep in mind. Okay, so what's the first area that I would focus on um, in this, this conversation? This is a pretty basic one, so it may seem uh, <laughs> almost obvious, but it, there's a few things I wanna point out about it. And this is often referred to as the term of the contract. So, when we, when we talk about the term, we're talking about the length of the contract. Um, this is obvious in the sense that this is, this, is, this is how long you're agreeing to be employed by this group. As I mentioned previously, in a lot of, in probably most employment arrangements, it's at will. That's not necessarily the case for physicians. There's often a term uh, that dictates how long you're gonna be employed. If you, um, if you are, uh, moving into a new city, you're making real sacrifices, you're turning down other uh, potentially um, attractive offers to join this group, you may want to have a longer term. Um, if, you're, if this is your only offer and you're weary of this group and you're not sure you want to stick around, you may want to have a shorter term. The first thing I look for in any contract is the term, and the second thing I look for is whether there's what's called a no-cause termination provision. What this means is that the uh, either party typically, they're typically bilateral, either party can give notice and terminate the contract 
and there's usually a notice period of 30, 60, 90 days. So first point I make here, like kind of big takeaway here is perhaps they've lured you in with a two year term and you think you have employment guarantee for two years. If you have, if they have a no cause termination right and they have a 60 day notice, that's the term of the contract, 60 days, not two years, okay? So that's something to, to really think about and keep in mind. So even if they told you, you know, in the whole negotiations for weeks leading up to it, we all of our contracts are two years, we want you here for two years. If it's got no cost termination provision, it's effectively, the, the contract is the length of that notice period. Um, the second thing I, I would point out about the term um, is if you are, if you're locked in for two years and there's not a no cause termination provision, meaning you don't have the ability to easily get out of the contract, you want to read the rest of the contract really carefully, unfortunately, because they're not really fun to read. Um, but the reason I say that is because um, you're agreeing to this stuff for potentially a long time, right? So if, if the scope of the practice is described in a way that just seems crazy to you, if they're saying you're going to have, you know, these really um, sort of outrageous call coverage requirements or, their, or the admin responsibilities far exceed what you thought you were signing up for. If you have a two year contract with no easy way out, you should, you know, make sure you're comfortable with all that. Alternatively, if you have an easy way out with a no cause termination provision, I don't pay as much attention to that stuff. Because you can always, if you arrive at the job and it turns out you're not very happy with how it's going, you, you can always renegotiate. Your commitment is only for, you know, 60 days or whatever the notice period is. So that's the first point I would cover. Um, the second point that I was hoping to cover is related to professional malpractice insurance. Now, I assume that you've all been told <clears throat> throughout med school, residents say you always want to have malpractice insurance. This is pretty obvious. Um, there's a concept called tail coverage, which is, it's important for you to understand. Maybe many of you do, but I think it's worth uh, me just taking a second to sort of explain the background of both sort of malpractice coverage and the significance of tail coverage. So um, first off, you know, malpractice coverage, you want to be, anytime you are practicing uh, as a physician, you want to have malpractice coverage and stop. That is really important for you. You may be like the best doctor in the world. It doesn't matter because there are people who will bring a lawsuit against you. And malpractice coverage doesn't just protect you from a judgment. It does that, but it also provides you with defense. That means it provides you with a lawyer. So if you don't have malpractice coverage in effect at a given time, then you are potentially on your own to hire and pay for a lawyer, even against frivolous lawsuits. You don't want that. So you want to have malpractice coverage covering all the everything you're doing, everything you've done, everything you're doing, so long as you're practicing, okay? All right, so what's this concept of tail coverage? In California, for historical reasons, malpractice policies are most typically claims made policies. Okay, what does that mean? It means that the policy has to be in effect both at the time the incident occurred, which is the alleged malpractice that occurred, right? And it also has to be in effect at the time the lawsuit is brought. That is kind of weird. That's not normal. If you've had car insurance before, those are usually incident-based uh, policies. As long as you have the insurance when the, when the incident occurs, when the accident occurs, you're covered, even if later you cancel your policy. So in California, professional malpractice insurance is a lot, it's a lot harder to get coverage. There, there can be a three year delay between, that's the statute of limitations, three years for a malpractice claim effectively, okay? So there can be a three year, in some cases, longer delay between when you were alleged to have done something wrong and they bring the lawsuit, okay? So it's important <laughs> that you have coverage for an extended period of time after you, after you, um, you know, are performing services. Okay, why does all this matter? Let's say you're working for an employer. Let's say you start your first job. 
they're going to pay for your malpractice coverage. Definitely. Never seen, I've never seen an employer that won't do this. In fact, they're required to do this. Okay. So they're going to do this. But then the question is, well, what happens when you leave the group? Okay. You, you either left voluntarily or they've terminated you. They're not going to pay for your, they're not going to keep you on the policy, right? They're going to take you off their malpractice policy. Okay. So because they're all claims made malpractice insurance policies, that would mean you wouldn't have any coverage for any claim that was brought after you left the group for services you, you provided while you were employed by the group. Okay. That's terrible. Like we said, you don't want to be not covered for anything at any time. Okay. So there's this concept called tail coverage. All the insurance companies sell it and you can buy it. And it's usually a one-time payment. And basically it converts your coverage into like an incident based policy. So all the, all the uh, services that you performed while you were at this group are now going to be covered, even though that group is no longer paying the premiums for you on an ongoing basis. Okay. So most important takeaway from this is you want it. You're, you're going to want this stuff. Um, you're going to want tail coverage. You're going to want your employer to pay for it because it can be expensive. Like, you know, five, $10,000 expensive probably in your situation after your first job, but it varies depending on how long you've been in practice, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, you're going to want your employer to pay for it. When I represent employers um, on these issues, like on employment agreements or employment relationships, I always say you should pay for it um, because you don't want your former employee not to have malpractice insurance because I don't know what they're going to do if they get sued. <laughs> they're, they're, you, you, it's just, it's in no one's best interest uh, for, for the physician to not have coverage. So your employer and your employment agreement should say that they're going to pay for tail coverage. I would say, I don't know what my slide here says. I think on the next slide, uh, I said 30% of contracts do not provide for tail coverage. That, I think that's, that's about right. It's not uncommon for the contracts to say it will not provide uh, tail coverage. This is like, this is like when I said the first thing I look at is the term. The second thing I look at is the no cause termination provision. The third thing I look at is tail coverage. Um, you want to have this in here. This is one of, this is in my opinion, this is one of the things that could potentially be a deal breaker. Um, it's not, not, not only is it an issue in terms of making sure you have coverage, it could affect future employment negotiations because your subsequent employer, like let's say you want to get another job with another employer, they're going to ask if you have tail coverage because they don't want you to not be insured while getting sued by a former patient. So if you don't have tail coverage, they may offer to buy you nose coverage. That's the opposite of tail coverage. But the takeaway here is let's just have your employer pay for it. Let's have it really clear in the outset that when you leave the employer, uh, either, either you quit or the contract expires if it's a term contract um, or they terminate you, uh, let's make it clear that they're going to, they're going to pay for it. So that's a big thing. Uh, I know it's a little bit of a complicated concept, um, but the takeaway is look for that when you're looking at this contract and make sure it's clear on that, not conditional, but clear that they're going to pay for it. Um, okay. Another concept I'm seeing this more and more, um, is non solicitation provisions that will say you cannot solicit the employer's patients. Okay. You're going to be working as a physician. You are going to have patients, right? But if you're working as an employee of a medical group, they're technically also the group's patients. The law is a little bit ambiguous here as to whose patients there are. Arguably, they're both of they're your, both of your patients. Okay, so it's a little um, it's a little bizarre for them to tell you that you cannot solicit your patients if, in the event that you leave the group. Not only is this bizarre because, well, they're your patients and. <laughs> They look at you as their doctor and they want to keep seeing you, but you actually have an ethical duty not to abandon your patients. So that means that if you leave practicing one place and you're going to another place, you have a duty to make sure they're either going to get continual care, or if you are going to continue practicing in that same service area that you inform the patients that uh, you're still available 
and what your contact information is going to be. Okay, so this can this this can the disputes can arise here, um, you know, at the time of leaving a practice where that practice may want your patients or may want to continue to provide services to your patients, and you want to take those patients away uh, and continue to provide services to them. A lot of these contracts I'm seeing say. Uh, that you agree not to solicit the patients, which arguably means uh, you agree not to contact them and tell them where you're going. I don't like this. It's arguably unenforceable, but it's not super clear. Some of the contracts even have things that say the patient lists are trademarks, which means that they are the property of the employer. So you can't even get the contact information for your patients uh, to tell them about where uh, you're going where your new practice is going to be. This is a mess. So ideally, a contract should not have a non-solicitation provision of patients. A lot of them do now. A lot of them. And what I'm what I'm what I'm telling people to do is to try to get some language in that contract where they will agree at the time of separation, at the time that you leave the group, they'll agree to. Um, to send out a joint notice with you to your patients, basically informing them of your new practice location. I think that's a reasonable solution. I try to get some language in the contract if possible. Again, tail insurance, I think is like number one important in my opinion, in terms of sort of where you're gonna put your negotiation leverage. I would say non-solicitation of patients, this is probably number two, okay? All right, um, here's a question. So what, what does this all mean? What happens if I breach the contract? Do people ever sue each other? Um, all right, so related to this, you're gonna have what's called an arbitration provision in your contract. 90% of the agreements I see have arbitration agreements in them. You're gonna have one. It means, it means you are agreeing to waive your right to go to court, you're waiving your right to jury um, in the event of a dispute. In many contexts, especially in labor contexts, depending on the claim, these are unenforceable. Don't worry about this. They're not gonna agree to take it out. You don't wanna have a weird, awkward conversation about wanting to take an arbitration provision because it's just a weird conversation. Um, I would not use your negotiation leverage to take out an arbitration provision in most cases. Um, there's also gonna be a related sentence probably in this provision that says that the losing party will have to pay the prevailing party's attorney's fees. Again. You have lots of rights under labor code to attorney's fees and penalties in certain circumstances. I, again, I don't think they're going to agree to take this out. It's an awkward conversation to have. People don't normally sue each other, which I'll get to in a second. But be aware these things are really standard these days and they're going to be in your agreement and they're going to be, they're just going to look weird. They're going to look crazy and you're going to be like, what the heck does this mean? I wouldn't worry about it in most cases. All right. But so, you know, do people, do people sue each other over this stuff? Um, depends. Not, not so much early in your career. Most of the time, if you are, um, if you are doing something that they don't like and they terminate you, um, and you go away, uh, they're not going to sue you. They're just going to be happy that you leave. That's going to be most of the cases. Um, uh, it's there as an employer. They're probably far more worried that you might bring a lawsuit against them uh, Subsequent to employment because like I said in California, there's lots of labor uh, Labor laws that are very favorable to employees um, There are certain things that increase your likelihood of being sued um, the number one thing is probably like I mentioned before the dispute over taking patient lists. I've seen circumstances where, or trying to take your patients, I mean, including trying to get those patient lists. I've seen circumstances where employers have claimed that just you going into the EHR system or, or, the, or uh, the system in the office that has contact information and taking, getting that information so that you can send a notice to your patients. I've seen employers take the position that that's a breach of HIPAA to threaten to report you, you know, or they're trying to employ them report the former employee physician. It can get, you know, really, really messy. Um, but typically people don't sue each other over this stuff. So keep that in the back of your mind, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't care about it. Um, this is, 
this is one red flag I wanted to raise. Um, there is there. There are these things, they're called recruitment agreements, and they, they typically involve a hospital subsidizing your pay for your first year of work. Um, and they're very complicated, and there's typically three agreements. <laughs> there's an employment agreement, and then there's a recruitment agreement, and then there'd be an agreement between your employer and the hospital. Um, you'd be asked to look at all three of them. Um, and these, these I have seen lawsuits uh, develop out of pretty regularly. They typically require that you stay in an area for four years or you have to pay back any of the money that was that was used to subsidize you. Um, what's the point here? If, if you get one of these, uh, be really wary. This is these are this is one of the things where I, I, I you know would seriously advise you to contact an attorney if you're getting one of these because I, I have over the years had uh, many uh, instances where physicians have said, hey, three years ago I signed this thing, it's a recruitment agreement, uh, I want to move, you know, my family moved out of town, I want to move there, and can I? And the answer is often no, you got to wait a little bit longer, or they, or they may really sue you. <laughs> so these are scary, be wary of these, um, make sure you understand the consequences of signing um, one of these. Okay, so I wanted to leave a little bit of time. This is obviously a very quick um, sort of uh, overview of these issues, but I wanted to leave a bit of, bit of time for questions and answers. I, I think some people may have been uh, putting some questions in the comments, um, but just to recap, you know, really quickly, uh, term length, again, that's the number one thing to look at in part because um, it, 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 uh, it affects how important the, con the rest of the contract is. Um, confront the uncomfortable. I didn't really note this before, but this is going to be an awkward conversation to some degree because you're talking about provisions that govern um, that govern the end of the relationship, but you're having that conversation at the beginning of the relationship. So um, you're just going to have to figure out what your comfort level with that is and how you can how you can use tone to uh, in your communications to try to sort of avoid any confrontation or awkwardness there. Um, and like I said. You know, avoid the red flags, the tail coverage, the non-solicitation provisions. And I offer the service, um, again, I'm biased, I think it's great, um, where I will look at a contract uh, for you um, and uh, talk to you about it. So uh, with that, uh, I would open it up to questions. I think Pam's going to maybe talk about yeah. the questions. Yeah. Um, Scott, thank you so much. You were packing in a lot of information in a short amount of time. So we really appreciate everything that you went over. Um, we do have a few questions in the queue. The first one is from Mira and she says, is there a resource or information for handling the step prior to the 50 page contract in regards to negotiating salary and bonuses? Um, there a uh, oh in terms of in terms of what are the standard um, in terms of what would be like the standard salary or bonus amounts that people are paying in an area is that the question I am at um, is there a resource for handling the step prior to the fifty page contract oh um, I I apologize I don't I don't know of of any resources for that like I I think there probably are um, there probably are organizations that publish uh you know like salary data and in, in a geographical location um but i'm not i'm actually not familiar with that i i don't typically advise on that that these things usually come to me after that after all those conversations have been had so i apologize they don't i don't have that i don't have a good answer for that that's okay um and we'll uh maybe gather these uh questions and answers and post them online um, we have a couple more minutes left and questions are coming in. So I'm gonna try to um, move through these quickly, but also if you can stay on the line for a little bit, um, that is uh, that would be great. And we'll try to get through as many as we can. The second question comes from Irene and she says, um, is tail coverage a one-time thing? So if my first employer paid for it, am I good? I am good all subsequent with all subsequent employers. You're, yeah, it's a one-time thing for the for the policy that was in effect, you know, during that that period of employment. So you don't if you get tail coverage after you leave one employer, you're never going to need to get tail coverage again for that employer. But subsequent employers, you're going to want to have you're going to want to make sure 
you're having the same conversation about who's going to be uh, providing tail coverage uh, for that period of employment because you're going to be on a new policy uh, for it with a different, probably a different company or it's the same company, but it, but a, a new insurance policy. Great. Um, next question. Uh, do you have any uh, important legal advice if joining a telemedicine group? Alternatively, a group that does direct primary care. Okay. <laughs> those are those are those That's are both question. really those are both really <laughs> good questions. Um, uh, so, uh, the telemedicine field is, in some ways, legally, it's developing really quickly this year. Um, no surprise. Um, it's been very slow moving, especially in California, um, in terms of. Um, in terms of allowing, for example, physicians to, to uh, practice medicine across state lines. Um, that has always been an issue, I think, historically in California. And, and maybe these things have been corrected in the last few months. I have not stayed up to date on that, on sort of the broad changes that are happening in telemedicine, other than I know that there have been a lot of orders issued to um, health plans that require them to pay uh, for telemedicine services at the same rate that, that, that a physician would be paid for for in-person services. So um, there is a lot of change happening right now. I'm afraid I, I don't have any sort of broad advice for a telemedicine group other than I would keep in mind that there are going to be both state and federal laws at issue. And if you are, um, if that group is outside of California, but it is but you would be treating patients in California or vice versa, any other state, it's going to be complicated is my guess that it seems like it should not be complicated because we live in a world where you can go on zoom and everything seems really easy, but, um, the laws are unfortunately really, um, not typically up to date. And when you're dealing with cross state lines, it gets really bad. Um, direct primary care, uh, direct primary care, uh, for anyone that uh, doesn't know that my experience typically refers to a uh, situation where um, patients uh, pay for your services uh, in addition or as an alternative to insurance. Direct primary care is usually, in, these terms are not super strict in my experience again, but um, concierge medicine is, is sort of the older term and I think that refers to working with a patient who does not expect insurance to pay at all. So they're just paying cash basically directly for the services. Direct primary care is, is, is supposed to be, I think, a bit of a hybrid between concierge and insurance so that people would pay um, a monthly, uh, uh, it's usually a monthly fee to have better access, for example, to a primary care physician. Um, uh, although, so what's the advice on that? Just these things are really complicated in terms of making sure that they don't violate payer contracts. So by that, I mean, you know, private payer contracts, HealthNet, Aetna, whoever, you know, whoever your group you're joining is contracted with, they want to make sure that they've hired a lawyer who, who has advised them that they're not in breach of these contracts by doing whatever they're doing to uh, to obtain that additional revenue from the patient and then related to that is you want to make sure that the medicare piece is covered correctly too uh, you don't want to get on the wrong side of medicare and by that i mean you don't want to charge a medicare patient for services that are covered by medicare that is that will get you into trouble um, mm -hmm. and it can be it can be really rough dealing with medicare um, so that those are, I don't know if that is a great answer, but the, that's like the, these are broad issues, um, but the, those are sort of my thoughts on, on, on them. Great, um, that's, that's super helpful. Um, we're actually uh, well over time. Um, so what I'll do is actually um, put together the questions and then uh, maybe we can do a little bit of follow-up and put a resource online on the CFP website. But uh, Scott, would you mind putting the slide back up with your contact information sure. and just maybe reiterate how you work with CFP members in providing um, 
some advice and uh, helping negotiate contracts as well as looking over employment uh, contracts as well. Yeah, so like I said, um, for CAFP members, and I've been doing this for the last five years, um, I don't know if my contact information is even up there. If you Google my name, you will find um, my very outdated looking website um, and, and uh, my direct number and my email are up there. Um, but uh, basically, I, when you receive one of these terrible looking um, employment agreements, uh, you can, uh, for a flat rate fee, uh, you, I will look at your agreement um, lovingly. I will look at it and then uh, I will have a call with you. Oh, there I am. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I will have a call with you and I will, uh, I will usually have this, usually the call is about an hour, um, but I'm, I'm pretty flexible. If you have questions, um, I, I will tell you any issues I've seen. Most people, I think, just appreciate having someone who's looked at these things before, tell them, it, make, make them feel like what they have isn't terrible, because <laughs> sometimes they look terrible. And, and if it is terrible, tell them why it's terrible and what they might be able to do about it. Um, and so, you know, happy to, happy to extend that to anyone who's a CAFP member, which I think, I think all of you watching this probably are, so. Um, Great. Um, well, so uh, again, Scott, thank you so much for spending part of your right. evening with us. And as um, a, a huge thanks to everyone who's on the line. Um, this is again, part of our summit learning series and we'll continue to have resources throughout the year for both medical students and residents. And we'll do some follow-up and make sure that some of these questions are answered and we'll close the loop on some of these. So once again, Thanks so much for joining us, and it was so good to see you. Um, Scott, a huge thanks. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone.